everyone to um, our uh, launch of this report in the intersection. Copies are outside. Uh, I'm Polly Carl, and I'm the director of the Center for Theater Commons here at Emerson College, and uh, very uh, fortunate to be here with uh, people who have been critically involved in the conversation um, that surrounds this report and partic participate in this report. Uh, and so I'm going to let you all introduce yourselves. Uh, I'm going to say just a couple of things, one, one quick little housekeeping thing, which is we are going to be out of here on the nose at 7 p.m., so I'm going to kind of cut off any conversation because a rehearsal has to come in, but then we're going to go out to the lobby and we'll all be hanging around and whatever needs to continue can continue. So I just want you to know that I'm going to be like, you know, obsessively pushing us right out the door at 7. So, um, all right, so uh, Diane, you want to introduce yourself? We'll do that first. And sure, I'm Diane Ragsdale. I, um, Currently, a PhD student, doctoral student at Erasmus University, uh, studying cultural economics and doing research on the American theater and the evolving relationship between the commercial and nonprofit theater over about 50 years, specifically. And uh, formerly, I was at Mellon, and before that, uh, worked at a number of arts organizations. And I, I uh, had the great privilege to attend the meeting and write up the document. That, so. I'm Bob Rustin, and uh, I uh, 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 f founded the Yale Repertory Theater in 1966, and with uh, Rob Orchard, we founded the American Repertory Theater in 1979 uh, Since then, I've been teaching at uh, Suffolk University, and uh, also writing plays. Uh, and in fact, we have a play that we're working on with Arts Emerson called King of the Schnorris, which is going to get a reading on November the 11th. <laughs> Week from Sunday. <laughs> and I'm Rob Orchard, the uh, 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 founder of Arts Emerson World on Stage and uh, the Office of the Arts at Emerson College. And we are the, uh, the really proud and honored hosts of the Center for the Theater Commons. And I'm David Darren, I'm the director of artistic programs at uh, Arts Emerson and uh, one of the founders of the Theater Commons and moderated the event that uh, this report was released by. And just to note, uh, we were, um, all of us were at that event except for Rob. And Rob, uh, will you just say what, what you did in 74 and 2000 and how you were involved in those two meetings? The two, so there were, this is the third meeting of, of three uh, right. that we're discussing here, but maybe just a, a minute of. Um, yeah, there, were, there was a, the first meeting was in uh, 1974, it was at Princeton University. Um, trying to find the right analogy for it, it was like a middle school dance. <laughs> um, you know, your first middle school dance, where you get into a room and you wonder, why am I here? Who are these people? I need to find my own corner. Um, it was very awkward, and uh, the, the, the two realms really didn't dance much at that meeting. Um, and then the, uh, 26 years later, in 2000, there was a convening um, at Harvard, a, Bob, you departed to Italy. <laughs> you weren't there. Um, and uh, uh, the, the, the two parties had gone to the senior prom, they got married, um, they were raising families, and they were dealing with rambunctious teenagers. <laughs> um, and then this final session, or the, the, the third of, of the convenings between the not-for-profit and the commercial theater was held in Washington, D.C. in November of 2011. And at that point, um, the question was, should we, should we keep this relationship going? And we need a marriage counselor to try to find the truth. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> and we're done. And we're done. And so now we're off to marriage counselor. Uh, so a couple things. The, the conversation tonight, uh, kind of uh, broken up into just talking a little bit about historicizing it, the background, how we came to the meeting. Uh, talk a little bit about shifting definitions of success, a little about how the commercial sector is involved, and, and then sort of where the meeting ended. Uh, we're not going to cover it all. It's really comprehensive uh, report, so I encourage you uh, to actually read the whole thing. It's pretty, um, uh, it's pretty amazing uh, a, a conversation, and uh, for, for my 15 or more years making theater, it's one of the most honest and sort of heartfelt conversations and Diane really captured it perfectly. So just to know we're not even gonna really scratch the surface uh, in the next 15 minutes. 
Um, David, would you start off, and, and I know Diane, you can chime in here too, but can you just talk about how this gathering came about in DC? Why did it seem in your mind like it was the right time to revisit this issue? 12 years had passed, if you put that in context a little? Sure, uh, a couple of pieces to this. The, how it came about uh, in many ways starts with Diane Ragsdale. Uh, I uh, had the great fortune of working with the um, support of the Mellon Foundation on a study that I did on uh, the state of new plays and the infrastructure for new plays called the Gates of Opportunity. And in that process, started to be in a regular conversation uh, with the Mellon Foundation and their goals around support for the new play sector. And ultimately uh, was able to uh, launch this thing called the American Voices New Play Institute at Arena State. And one of the things that we were supported in doing was regular convening of the field around issues of importance to the new plays in, in the U.S. And in the first year, we had done three, and uh, those uh, were primarily, well, the first was focused on diversity, uh, actually it was, yeah, diversity in, in uh, new plays, and then uh, African-American playwrights wanted to meet to talk about what stories we're allowed to tell these days, um, and then uh, devising companies wanted to meet to talk about how the new play infrastructure was actually related to their uh, challenges and whether they fitted or not, and how it served and didn't. Uh, and so this, what started to happen was that we would listen to a group of uh, people who were asking questions and try to support the, um, that uh, investigation. And I was doing this work with Jamie uh, Galoon and with Jay Matthew, who are also part of the Center for Theater Commons here now. And uh, at the same time, Mel and Diane, I think your interest in this issue was starting to turn into serious interest, like maybe you were going to spend your PhD years in <laughs> it. Um, and so Mel convened a conversation very tiny conversation right at the same time that I was starting to think about maybe we should convene one in the, in the Institute. We had five resident playwrights uh, and one of the things that was really challenging for them was understanding the, the role for some of them. They were entering this, this set of conversations around uh, relationships with commercial producers. Their agents were pushing them in that direction. The theater we were all working in at Arena was starting to do more and more of this work and it was increasingly bizarre results. And so it seemed, from our standpoint, that it was the right time to actually sit down and talk about these questions just very personally from what it was that was going on in our place. Diane, at, at the same time, organized this very small, very powerful lunch uh, at, at, um, at the Mellon Foundation, uh, really quietly off the record, but that was the moment where Gregory Mosher and Rocco Lansman, and Rocco, you know, he's now the chairman of the NEA, but he was uh, a commercial producer for many years prior to taking that job, and still, um, will, he'll return to it when it comes out. Uh, and as we, as we find out, a longer history with this issue than probably anybody. Mm -hmm. And he had written a series of uh, uh, editorials, and Gregory Mosher had attacked him as being wrong around this issue, where he, Rocco was calling danger, danger, this back in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And Gregory wrote an editorial back saying, no, you're wrong, um, and they had a public argument about this. So we get to this um, luncheon, after all these years of these two sides being, having been staked out like, you know, the two sides of the, you know, Hatfields and McCoys, <laughs> and Mosher very quietly started the meeting by saying, I just have to say, back then, I didn't see it, but you were right. And I'm here to say you were right, and let's start from there. And that was like, it holy was. crow, it's time to have a real conversation. <laughs> If he's gonna, and he brought the editor, remember he brought yes. the article, he put it on the, paper, on the table and said, you know, I just want to say you were right. And so that meeting was really powerful and it, it was clear that something else needed to bubble up from that amount of energy. So we tried to recreate that moment but with a wider circle of people here. And then they started off sharing their stories about how, you know, what they had said at the time and where they thought it had gone. And I thought that was, they set a tone of generosity and, and authenticity there. Um, by sharing their own personal, um, you know, the, the process and their own um, concerns and discomforts about their own opinions and how they change, not just mm -hmm. about their behaviors, but about their, for themselves, how their thinking had evolved. So that's kind of where it came from. Um, and it, 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 the second thing that was happening, and I will throw this in there because it's important about who we are, we also had a, a fellowship program there where we were training uh, new producer, we were running a, a producer's uh, fellowship program uh, through this institute, and one of the producers in that uh, fellowship program, his focus was on commercial work, and so he wanted to uh, 
produce a convening on this intersection. We had all this evidence in, at Arena that ooh, the results are all over the place and the, and the energy goes scattered in many different directions. And then this thing had happened, which really said, okay, well, let's do it through the Institute. Let's do it at Arena. Let's focus it on new place. And so that was what we did. Diane, can you talk a little bit about, I mean, two things, you know, one, I just think it'd be interesting for people to hear a little bit about your methodology putting this together, because it's a pretty rigorous, um, pretty rigorous methodology. Uh, I, I, I had the pleasure of being one of the people that worked with Diane to edit the piece, and I, I think I changed the period once, and I got like a, you know, 700, you know, word email back saying, I, that period was over here, and that, so it's really, it's very rigorous, <laughs> it was a really rigorous uh, editing process, uh, you know, yeah. but if you could talk about that, and then also, just in, you know, as the, as the person who tried to sit back in that meeting objectively, um, you shared a little bit about just what surprised you as you, you know, both sat there, but also went back through all that uh, material. Sure. Well, from a methodological standpoint, I mean, there are a couple of things that were top of mind as I was putting it together. And I remember we had some initial emails to say, well, what, what kind of report is this going to be? Because there, you know, there are many ways you can document something. And I, at the time that the convening happened, the decision was made to close the meeting, in part because there was, a, it was acknowledged that it was going to be important for people to be able to talk candidly about their concerns to the degree that they had them. And everyone felt that if the press were sitting there, hanging on every word, or if it was even a performance for 250 people, that it would be very difficult for people to speak candidly. However, the choice to close the meeting was controversial. And uh, in part because the, co the, the, the uh, Institute had a, had, had a historic <coughs> precedent for opening up all of its meetings, but also because this is a rather sensational topic for some. Uh, some people don't actually, it's not on anybody, some people's radar at all, but for some press, uh, it, was, it was a rather controversial topic and there was a sense that people should be allowed to know what was happening. With that in mind, I felt that it was really important to let the participants speak for themselves and to, to share as, as kind of straightforwardly as possible the arc of that meeting, trying only to kind of uh, coalesce certain parts under themes in order to help the reader kind of tease out what were the, what the major points that were made, but, but without kind of coming in with a big slant or, 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 or judgment on what happened. Because I, I wanted both the participants to feel as though their story were accurately told, but I also wanted readers, there were people who were questioning, you know, whether I should even document it. And I remember that, where people were like, well, like, well why should Diane Ragsdale be trusted to tell this story, you know? And, and you know, it's true. Why, I mean, why should anyone be trusted to tell a story in some ways? That it, we, and so I, I didn't want to betray that. And so in, in large part, when you read the report, and you guys were there, you, it, it, it follows you know, quite closely the actual arc of the meeting. And the hope is that it will bring readers into the room and really uh, be able to understand that these 25 people were wrestling with these issues. I mean, these are complex issues, and they can't be sort of simply, you can't sort of just pick up the report and go, well, it's clear that these deals are bad, and we just shouldn't do that. Or, I think it's fine, you know, which was kind of the tenor of the 2000 meeting. Like, well, you know, we need the money and it's probably not going to do much harm, so let's just let the sleeping dogs lie. It's more complex than that. And I think as you read the report, you see, you really get a sense of individuals struggling with these issues. Both moral and legal issues, I think, that come up. So that, that, that's, that has a lot to do with why it's structured the way it is, why you sort of read a lot of the you know, first person sort of account. Um, and as I sat there and listened, I, I think I went up to Polly at one point during the meeting and said, is it just me or I wonder if everyone realizes how, what they're saying? Because I was struck by the fact that um, people were speaking quite candidly about um, you know, things like their relationship to money and uh, how their own personal values had changed over time and how this affected their choices and, and a recognition of the disconnect between how they were perhaps mm -hmm. behaving now, their practices now, and what they believed in when they got into the theater in the first place. And th that seemed to me to be the real, the real step forward from the last meeting. Right, which is that 
that in, the, in 2000, it seemed as though there was not space for people to say, you know, actually, I'm, I'm worried about this. And that, I mean, the, the sense of will these deals corrupt nonprofits? I think, every, I mean, nobody thinks that these are individuals. That, I don't think everybody's think, thinking these are individuals that are just so greedy that they're just going to do things that are unethical, you know, just because they don't, they don't have the good sense to, or the morals to do otherwise. I, think, I don't think that's the issue. But I think that the corruption, which the group seemed to sort of um, arrive at, was this very thing that Rocco really had put his finger on a long time ago, which is the thing that's going to get corrupted <coughs> is your definition of success. And if you can't, as a nonprofit theater, hold up an alternative value system and an alternative definition of success, if Broadway becomes the way you define success in the nonprofit sector and all of the things we associate with Broadway, New York Times reviews, celebrities, Tony Awards, etc., then you've kind of lost your center. And that's the thing that gets corrupted. And that's the thing that I think this room acknowledged has been corrupted. And, in, and yet in 2000, I think the sense of, you know, is there corruption or not was kind of like, no, there's not, mm -hmm. change the subject. Mm -hmm. So that to me, that was, that was kind indeed. of, the, when I stood back, that was the thing to me that seemed um, really meaningful about this mm -hmm. meeting, was that sense of, yeah, that has changed. And perhaps these deals haven't caused that change. I mean, you could say, it, but it seems to be part of that shift. Mm -hmm. you know? Yep, right, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, to that end, you know, I wonder, Bob, you're, you're um, just to, to think a little bit more about the trajectory of, you know, when it all started and where we are now, um, you're, you're quoted in the book as saying, I'm going to just read this brief quote, the geography of the American theater, which we're neglecting to talk about, is from idealism, obscurity, passion, commitment, to a certain modicum of fame, to being accepted and going after the next piece, that, that's going to get you even more accepted. It happens to individuals, it happens to playwrights. And you're really referencing a shift in sort of where the idealism of the beginnings of the regional theater movement and not the profit theater movement to this moment where our, our, our definitions are starting to slide about why we're involved. And I just wonder if you could talk more about um, that kind of historical shift. Well, but there are reasons for it, of course, and they're always partly economic, not entirely economic. But, uh, but this movement was really started as an alternative to Broadway and not as an extension to Broadway. And um, the last thing in the world we expected it to be was to be a kind of a tryout grounds for Broadway musicals or Broadway plays. We were going to create our own theater, uh, which um, established the commonality and the family and the collective nature of theater, uh, as opposed to the pickup casts and the star-driven uh, and sometimes commercially driven quality of the, of the, of the New York theater. And that first uh, TCG conference uh, is something I wrote about in the Times, and uh, my title was Broadway and the Nonprofit Theater, A Misalliance. And from the very beginning, I really, and to this day, I see this as a mismarriage, as a mismating, something that really uh, changes the nature of, of, of both movements. Now, our movement, essentially, was really built on the notion of company. I cannot emphasize this enough, even though there are maybe no more than one or two or three companies left in the country. But it was the notion of company, that that was what that, uh, gave us our particular quality and difference from the, from the uh, commercial theater. And we would, didn't invent this idea. If you look at history, all the great theaters were companies. Let's just start with Shakespeare. I mean, Shakespeare's had the Lord Chamberlain's company, a collection of actors and playwrights, and let us assume designers as well, prop people, uh, who had their audience and were familiar with their audience, their audience was familiar with them, uh, and they were deeply engaged in evolving productions out of their company with their playwrights. I'm teaching uh, a, a script breakdown of Hamlet now it's at Suffolk, uh, where I, uh, where I am at the moment. Uh, and I was very interested in this, these 12 lines that Hamlet wrote. Uh, you know, he said, can you do 12 lines or so that I'll write for you? Uh, uh, and then he gives, uh, I was interested what the 12 lines were in the play, The Murder of Gonzaga. And I began to get an idea from the fact that um, 
he addresses the actors. And you know that famous speech, speak the speech I pray thee, as I uh, uh, wrote it trippingly on the tongue. And do not mouth it as some players do, or else I'd rather, I'd just as leave the town cry, I spoke my lines. And do not saw the air too much with your hands thus. And let those that are clowns, you know, speak no more than a sit down for the. This is a playwright talking to the actors of the company. It's not just Hamlet talking to the uh, player king. It's Shakespeare talking to his fellow actors and saying, you're screwing up my plays. <laughs> uh, and you're giving a little too much flamboyance, you know. And don't invent lines. I wrote the lines. I intend to hear them as they were written. Every playwright has this complaint. Now, um, from here we go to Moliere and the Comedie Francaise. And from there we go, you know, through a succession of companies. Uh, for example, the Moscow Art Theater Company and, uh, and Stanislavski and Chekhov. And then we go to the Berlin Ensemble and Bertolt Brecht, who's both a director and a playwright. And the interesting thing about most of these theaters, especially as we get into the modern period, is that they have training units. So the uh, Moscow Art Theater has a school which is training for the theater. So young blood will come in, and uh, Nina will not be played by a 75-year-old woman who once had the, had the role for the last 50 years, but rather by a newly trained uh, young woman who can play that part, and uh, the old Nina will go on and play Madame Arcadna. So there was a, a kind of organic quality going on in this kind of theater, where we had a collective that the actors knew each other's plays, knew, uh, had shortcuts you know, in rehearsal, uh, had a connection with the playwright, could indeed suggest changes in the plays, even though Shakespeare didn't like that, but most playwrights do re respond to that according to how they would play it best or looking at the consistency in their own characters. So you have a training ground and you have a collective company and you also have an audience which is part of that family. Uh, you get an audience that comes to your theater not to see a hit or a flop, but comes to see a succession of plays which if the, the artistic director is any good, uh, has related those plays one to the other to make some kind of statement. So it's not whether this play is successful or that play is successful, but you come to see actors mutating, changing, transforming from part to part. And it even changes the whole nature of acting. So that instead of just doing versions of yourself, as the actor's studio would have us do, which is great for the movies, you transform. You are unrecognizable, ideally, from one part to the other. And I admit that one of the, one of the lapses and, and fallbacks uh, of this uh, kind of uh, situation is the problem that you'll see an actor over and over again, you'll get tired of him, you'll get tired of her. But if the actor is any good, you will not recognize her, and you will not recognize him. And my best example is Meryl Streep on the stage of the Yale Repertory Theatre doing a play called The Idiot's Karamazov by a fellow student named Christopher Durang another fellow student named Alvin Lurado, uh, and she was in her third year, and she was completely unrecognizable. Uh, she had a ward on her nose, she had a gray hair, she was in a wheelchair, and she was playing Constance Garnett, the ancient translatrix, as it was called. And she was saying to the audience, go home, go home, go home. And uh, it was a wonderful evolution uh, of, of a young woman into an old woman, and that was the ideal for this kind of theater. So I long for that, uh, and I don't see it anymore. Uh, and I, I noticed that each major theater began to dissolve and become commercial once it sent a piece of the company to New York with a play. And that was the end of the company. It happened with the Long Wharf, it happened at the Guthrie, it happened at the Arena, it happened at any number of theaters around the country. And uh, if we can get back to a situation where companies will be supported economically by the culture, by the National Endowment for the Arts, by the Mellon Foundation, which, by the way, is one of the most, if not the most, enlightened arts foundations in the country, if not in the world. And Diane Ragsdale has been a fantastic force in that uh, foundation. But what we need is this economic support, because ultimately, uh, everything you see that's going wrong, if you think it's going wrong with the nonprofit theater, is going wrong for economic reasons. Thank you.
Yeah, know, I just please, no, go right not, around. Not yeah. to spare about the company idea. Yeah. I think, you know, I think that those ideals have been reinvented by a younger generation. And you see that now in some of these smaller ensemble companies that are devoted to that kind of collective ideal, that are staying together, that do know that shorthand, that are capable of transforming. Um, and that's, that's an encouraging sign for me. Um, uh, it may not be the case in the larger institutional structures, but it is bubbling up through some of these you know, younger ensemble companies. And I, I think the, the word misalliance is, is a right one, because if you, if you go back and you look at um, some fundamentals that relate to the for-profit and the not-for-profit world, I mean, why do we have these two worlds? I mean, why is there a theater that exists in the not-for-profit world and a theater that exists in the for-profit? And, and, it's, and, and there are advantages for the not-for-profits because they have tax advantages, they can receive contributions, and, and, and the government has given, anointed these groups as not-for-profit. It's a motive thing. They're organized not-for-profit and they're given these various tax advantages because the government is saying that they are providing a service to the public that could not be provided if they were structured for the purposes of making a profit. And that exists not only in culture, but it exists in, in, in human services, in health, in religion, and in education. So the misalliance is a fundamental one between the not-for-profit world and the for-profit world. It is built into their structure. The for-profit world exists with one measure of success only. And I, I'm, I'm not criticizing it. It's pure, it's simple, it's clean, and it's there to make a profit. So a production that goes through the for-profit commercial channel exists as long as it's making a profit. And the producer, the commercial producer, has a fiduciary responsibility to shepherd that production along and to make choices that maximize the profit. And as soon as it stops making a profit, it closes, clear and simple. The measure of success in the not-for-profit world is much more complicated, and that, I think, is what began to be part of an interesting discussion uh, in Washington. So this intersection is really a crossroad, mm -hmm. all right? And, and the crossroad is full of the potential for collision. Um, you can't deny the basic, fundamental, foundational aspects of one is a marketplace, transactional, and totally aligned with money, and the other has a larger ideal to it. And that's where I think, you know, we constantly have to ask ourselves, those of us who are involved in leadership roles and institutions in the not-for-profit world, how are we distinct from the for-profit world? What is the service to the public that we are providing? And what are our ideals, and what is the ethical nature upon which we're operating. And, and we have a mission, and we need to constantly, um, and I think it might be important for organizations to articulate as they do their mission statement, but what are their, what's their value statement? What's their ethical statement? And more importantly, how do they measure success? And then I think you're in a position to understand. Um, but we are relying upon each other. There's a lot of synergy between these two worlds, inevitably. Everybody wants the work that's done, whether it originates in the nonprofit world or, or originates solely in the commercial Broadway world. Isn't it wonderful if it just has a life and everybody gets a chance to see it and, 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 and younger artists and risks can be taken and there's a, there's a natural kind of very constructive and positive um, relationship between the flow of work that comes in, maybe in the not-for-profit world, where they are able to take the risk, where they can embrace younger talent, and then that talent bubbles up and it goes into the commercial world. And, you know, there was a lot of discussion in, in this report that I agree, people were incredibly frank and it was beautifully articulated, um, uh, about the, the, the need that the commercial world has to, 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 to I mean, it's a far team. I, I don't want to put it in those sorts of major league, minor league terms, but it's not, they're totally different. But there, there needs to be, there, I know, I just did, didn't I? No, there needs to be, it's a good analogy. There needs to be, there needs to be, um, uh, there needs to be a healthy relationship. Um, and, uh, uh, and that's what they were struggling to find. Um, but a lot of it gets corrupted by transactionalism. 
and materialism. And I, I say, if the, if the commercial theater's producers want there to be a relationship with the not-for-profit world, then every time a play emerges in a successful situation in the commercial world, that that commercial producer has an obligation <coughs> to acknowledge and to compensate every other theater that had anything to do with developing that play. And if producers did that, they would change the whole atmosphere between the two worlds. Very interesting. Yeah, the, I think this sort of crowding out of the social value or cultural value of nonprofits is one of the things that that, that resonates for me. That it's it, because not for profit, it's easy to just turn that into like, well, as long as we're not making money, maybe, you know, maybe we're we're doing okay. But it's really what you know. Are you continuing to fulfill your social uh, mission, David? I wonder if you would. Remember that point, the, the discussion of the coming into the intersection and what the commercial producers want and what the nonprofits want. Would you be willing to? Yeah, I remember you were having that conversation at the time that you know where some of the collisions come in because the, the two come in at, 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 with sort of different uh, purposes. Well, I mean, the, yes, the commercial. See, and I'm I'm someone who thinks the the terms of engagement are off and they are corrupted and they are they are dangerous and they're and they're hot right um, and yet we're all in one ecology and so for me the whole purpose of this conversation was how can we be responsible respectful maintain our value sets intact as we move through this inter intersection how do we how do we do this with integrity um, and and recognizing that that's not what we're that's not our primary um, concern right now in the way that we're behaving. So in, in, in this word behavior actually became an issue. Remember people were saying, well, you say it's a behavior, there you're already implying that there's something wrong with it, and it's not a behavior, it's a, you know, it's a commercial, and it's, it's, a, it's a business relationship, or whatever, they're all trying to say it's not behavior. But as the commercial producers are approaching this intersection, they are trying to get for as little money as possible, as good an idea of what, how the play is going to succeed in the world, in the marketplace, and what needs to happen for it to succeed in the marketplace as cheaply as possible. They get that from an audience reaction. They can't do it in a studio. People have to actually buy tickets. And so they have to have an audience that's buying tickets for them to know what they're learning. And, but what they're going, when they go through that intersection, out the other side is toward the commercial success of this for themselves, for the artists who made it. They're going for this very long life that returns money for a really long time in big numbers. And they're legally obligated to do that. That's, no, it's their responsibility. That's exactly right. And, and it's clean, clean, it's clear, it's really, everybody involved knows that's what's going on and it's fine. Everybody signed up for it and hoping that it succeeds. You know, nobody goes into it uncomfortable if that's, because it's really clear. You're trying to get through, and in that intersection when they're in, in the regional theaters in the nonprofit world, they're trying to get through that as clearly and as cheaply as possible. Information at the lowest cost or something. Right, yeah, yeah, well, yeah. The, 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 the most information at the lowest cost, that's it, yeah. Um, and on the other side, you have the, the nonprofit organization, which its trajectory, it's not financial success, it's a long-term conversation with the community and the artists that it makes work with, and they're trying to find how is the extension of this relationship between our stage and our community um, over time, how are we going to keep that vibe? How are we going to make that a vibrant artistic space? How are we going to stay relevant to the world? How are we going to make it sound financially? And they're moving through. So, so here comes the commercial producer going right down that aisle, and the the nonprofit producer is going along this way, and they're trying to have this trajectory that's related to their community, to the artists that they're working with, and to you know I, I have to read this quote because it's so on my mind. But it's, I mean, and, yeah, and the sustainability of that, and the institution and the infrastructure. And Zelda's, Zelda, uh, when nonprofit status was conferred on theaters, there was a big, um, you know, it was a, a debate on Capitol Hill, and there was testimony requested for why should it be extended to theaters. It already existed in certain realms, did not exist in the theater. And a piece of Zelda's, uh, Zelda Fichana, who founded Arena Stage, a piece of her testimony goes like this. Once we made the choice to produce our plays, not to recoup an investment, but to recoup some corner of the universe for our understanding and enlargement. We entered the same world as the university, the museum, the church, and became like them an instrument of civilization, right? So here comes this car going that way that's trying to recoup some corner of the universe as an instrument of our civilization. And they, and they're, you know, they need to sustain that inquiry. They're trying to do this thing that has nothing to do with that thing. 
And somewhere in the middle, they come into that intersection together. And how does everybody get through that? To, in, in a way that has integrity, that they get where they're going financially and the kind of success, global success. Artists need that success. There's nobody saying they don't. Um, and, or, or just can merit it, you know? <laughs> People can have it. And this other thing going that way, of a sustained effort to recoup some corner of the universe. And, and David, it seems to me, do you think this is accurate, that what you see is that that longer term ambition of the nonprofit can get derailed because by doing In the interest, right, right there. In that, that it's sort of then suddenly the, the, the measures of, of success are short term. Mm -hmm. And did it sell out? And did we get to Broadway? And if, you're if forgetting about that. If I can propose, um, the fact that nonprofits don't put their head in the sand, they're really interested in ending up in the black, and we work very hard to raise money uh, and to attract audiences, and if possible to get money from commercial producers. But you don't get it by having them hand you a project and saying, would you try this out? Uh, and Because they're going to be around, nosing around, or wanting to have some impact on it and some influence on it. So if you get a project from a commercial producer, and that commercial producer wants to have a say in it, you've got to drop it, because it's no longer yours. But if you put on a show, and it's successful, let's say, and Broadway gets interested in it, and Rob was brilliant at this, you know, you don't make an agreement with the Broadway producer before you put the show on, you make the agreement after the show. Uh, and to take this example of Big River, which was misrepresented in the Globe, because it said that that was the first move to Broadway, one of the early moves to Broadway in a part of a nonprofit theater, we didn't move that show to Broadway. We did that show, and Rocco Landisman had given us the original play. It was an adaptation of Huckleberry Finn by a former student of mine named uh, Bill, Bill uh, Hauptman. Rocco Landisman was a former student of mine at the same time. So this was family coming back, and let's do this play. And then Rocco said, oh, by the way, I think it would be good as a musical. I said, fine. Let me ask some of the people I know who write music. And I asked James Taylor, and I asked uh, Carly Simon, and I asked uh, uh, her sister, uh, Lily Simon, and uh, none of them could do it. And then and he said, I know a uh, composer named Roger Miller. I said, I never heard of him. <laughs> he said, well, listen to this. And he played in a gang, Dang Me, and I liked it very much. I said, okay. He went out there, got six songs, and he brought them back. And Roger Miller wrote the music for our musical. And then uh, we had uh, Les Des Mackinoff, who was with La Jolla Theater at the time, as the artistic director, directing it. Heidi Landisman, former wife of Rocco, was doing the set. She was a great set designer. And then it moved to La Jolla with a completely different cast because we still had our company doing other plays. That cast then went to Broadway. It was La Jolla production that went to Broadway. But Rob had, a, had wrangled a, 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 an agreement with the Rocco, uh, who was producing that, to the effect that we got a certain royalty. And we, I think, got as much as $300,000 from, uh, from that production without ever signing over our lives for it. And it's also true of actors. If the actors want to go to Broadway, God bless them. If the playwrights want to go to Broadway, God bless them. But the fact is that they are trained uh, for nonprofit theater. If they function in nonprofit theater, they will come back to nonprofit theater. Merrill comes back. Christopher Walken comes back. Uh, Sigourney Weaver comes back. They all come back to their, their roots, uh, and they're happy to be there. And so they can spread themselves. The same thing with the playwrights. Our first year at Yale, our second year at Yale, we had a playwrights program, which we wrangled out of RCA. They had formerly been giving it for television. That's what was happening at Yale in those days. They were training for television. We were training for theater. So we got RCA to give us money for something called writing for the camera. Uh, and we called <laughs> Sam Shepard, David Mamet, these people when they were kids, Barbara Garson, Megan Terry, John Ware, Lanford Wilson, and we had an incredible group of playwrights there. And they would begin to write plays for us. We got a lot of plays out of Sam Shepard, a lot of plays out of David Mamet, uh, and so forth and so on. And this was, uh, this was a loyalty that they owed to us and they gave to us at the same time that they were doing Glenn Gary Don Gross on, the, on Broadway. So that can work, but it won't work if you make agreements beforehand uh, to let the commercial producer have a part in the, uh, in the production. Of the so, so there's a, following on this just to make sure it's clear, these, these distinctions, because what's happening now and what is, what is 
partly the, the disturbing piece of this, is that the rights to a project are actually owned by the commercial producer at the outset. And the commercial producer goes to the nonprofit and they say, I have the rights to project X. Let's call it rent, because that was that's one of the big ones. I have the rights to this project. And I'm not sure this is exactly the way rent went, but but um, so let's pick one that it is. Uh, Little Mary, Little, Mi Little Miss Sunshine. Okay. I have the rights to the movie Little Miss Sunshine, and I want to make a Broadway musical out of it. And it would be a lot cheaper for me if you, La Jolla, produced the first production of Little Miss Sunshine. Mm -hmm. And I would give you the money that it costs you to produce this play, because it's going to cost you less than it would cost me to do it myself. And I'm going to give you a certain amount, however they work that out. I'm going to hold the rights. And so we're going to hire now the director, but I'm going to tell you who the director is, um, because that's the director I want to work with. And I'm not sure that it's just, it maybe doesn't even matter to the, the commercial producer, it doesn't need to matter who the director, who the director is that the nonprofit wants. They own the rights. So they keep just they get to keep saying, we like those actors, we don't like those actors. We like that set, we don't like that set. We like the production schedule, we don't like the production schedule. We like the marketing materials, we don't like the marketing materials. And over and over and over and over, those things that are supposed to be the responsibility of the nonprofit as part of their long sustained conversation with their community about recouping some corner of the universe, they've handed over all that responsibility to that to the commercial producer. What was really interesting in the conversation in the, in the meeting was that the commercial producers were saying, yes, but we're artists too. And you in the nonprofit world won't let us be artists. You make us the money bags. You make us the bad guys. But we are coming to you with the best projects. You wouldn't do this project if, you know, you, you didn't pick this. You didn't get the rights to it. We got the rights to it. There would be no next to normal and if there hadn't been David Stone. And they developing these and projects sometimes. sometimes. Yeah, right, right. years and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. So they don't see themselves as the money bags, just write the check and disappear. They're invested artistically, and they feel they have an artistic uh, voice in the developmental process. And the nonprofit producers are saying, and for good reason, no, actually, we have a responsibility. This 501c3, we're the stewards of that, and it's going this way for a different purpose, and we have to make those artistic decisions. And then the money doesn't, you don't get the money, and you, and you don't get the, the opportunity. And where, where it gets tweaked is in right in there when the artistic director of the nonprofit says, okay, we will do this project together. But since the commercial producer is holding the rights and the commercial producer is paying for it, and the long future, financial future, goes that way, they control that, all of the artists who are involved in that are really reporting to the producer, not to the, not to the artistic director of the nonprofit. There is no way for Molly Smith to stand there at Arena and say, I actually don't like the choices you're making about this script now, and I would like another script conference because I think three rights has gone off the rails. She cannot say that. She can say it. Nobody has to listen to her. Um, and, and that's everybody. I happen to be working at Arena. That's why I use Molly. Not, Molly's not some uh, outlier in all of this. It's just what happens. And so that's where I think the big problem comes. The, the producers are coming with the rights. The commercial producers are coming with the rights to the projects. And then they are buying the tax exemption of the nonprofit in order to do the thing more cheaply. And then they're driving on through and making their um, success with it. And often they're kicking back you know, a percentage, like you, the relationships that, that do create some return. But the cars come in going this way, then it goes that way. And in the middle, they've used the nonprofit um, exemptions, for which there's a very specific purpose, which is to recoup a corner of the universe. I, I want to just jump in with one last question related to this, and then we, we'll have like a couple minutes of conversation, and then we can uh, continue it outside. But uh, Oscar is just, uh, in, in terms of this question of you know the pressures on the not-for-profit and why they make these deals. So Oscar is just, uh, who's the artistic director at the Public Theater in New York, uh, he said during the, um, our gathering, uh, we should be clear that this cultural shift, and by cultural shift he's referring to the sort of more transactional nature of the culture, uh, we should be clear that this cultural shift is not something that could be changed by her, a heroic chairman of the NEA. This is happening across the world. And there is a distinction that I just want to make really clear. There is the addiction. There is the drug. There is the fact that, of course, the Tony Awards are fun and the acclaim and all that. That temptation is a personal temptation that each of us has got to wrestle with. It's our job to wrestle with it. But there's also the question of the money and following it, which is different. It's 
not about how tempting it is. It's about the fact that those of us who are charged with running institutions are charged with making those institutions succeed and be healthy. Because if they aren't, no artists are going to get paid and no art is going to happen. And I just wonder if you can respond to that. I mean, what I, what I heard you know, consistently from the artistic directors in that meeting was the unbelievable pressure um, to continue to perpetuate these incredibly large institutions. And you know, that it's not just about temptation, but it's really about the survival of the institution. So. That's true. I mean, uh, you know, but it's always been about that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's never been easy. Yes, there have been times when there was more money coming from the government and then when the foundation were more actively involved. And there was a different coalition of funding sources in place. And they shifted and they changed and nonprofit organizations are very nimble in that regard. It's always that pressure. Um, it's true that our culture is more transactional now and the marketplace is, is, is a heavier influence. But the other part of the money, which gets back to, um, you know, I just like to make a recommendation, okay? Because I, I think there's been a lot of talk about this. There are things that can be done. And I hinted at it before. Um, and Big River is a good example. Because yes, we were able to negotiate a percentage of the, of, of the weekly grosses on that. But you know what? La Jolla really should have had some of that too. Because the producer was only willing to give away that percent and a half, that percent and a quarter, to us because we negotiated it. And then it went to La Jolla and it morphed. It got six more songs, became a full-fledged full musical and it went to New York. That's unfair. It was just simply unfair. And, and so if, if in this world we have for the not-for-profit institutional theaters the same thing that the playwrights have. The playwrights have the drama skill, which stipulates certain limitations and rules about how the commercial theater has a relationship and, and transacts a relationship with the writer. It could be the same thing. Some other guild is invented that represents the not-for-profit theater world, and every time a play, as Rita Ringway said before, finds its way into that commercial world, that there is a rule that you take that percent and a half or that percent and a quarter and you divvy it up among theaters that had a seminal influence on the development of that writer or the development of that play. And then the, 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 the boards and the leaderships of these nonprofit theaters can relax because it's going to be fair. It's going to happen. And they don't have to grab after that particular uh, corner of the commodity of that particular project. Um, and then you, and then the, 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 the energy flows much more positively back and forth between the two realms. Well, there is a model for that. It's got to be a solution. Which was the August Wilson's play. August Wilson used to move his plays from the Yale Repertory Theater under Lloyd Richards, then to the Goodman Theater, and then to another theater on its way to Broadway. And I imagine that all those theaters participated to some extent, maybe I'm wrong, in, uh, in that movement. But that was a form of theater which I called Mac theater, you know, after McDonald's. Uh, I didn't like it. It just seemed to me to be a kind of sellout by the theaters to, uh, to a popular playwright, uh, a very good playwright, but a popular one. Uh, and you were not really doing your own work. You were doing shared work, as it were. And you were losing, inevitably, a sense of your own identity as a theater. Uh, in this transaction. And this topic of nonprofit co-productions came up at the meeting as well. Yeah, and yeah. it was interesting that that the artistic directors were almost equally as concerned about that practice. And and so we tend to think, oh this is just about commercial nonprofit partnerships. But actually anytime um, I mean people go to work for nonprofit theaters because they want to make the work. They want to make the work there. They don't want to necessarily have a, a, a piece come in from another theater that's already been 95% produced and then just kind of gets trucked in to the next theater and the next theater. And I think that's another interesting issue to be grappled with. But building on something you said, David, about the, the you know, you were sort of describing the, these counter purposes. I mean, I think it's also important to acknowledge that, that these de deals get put together in different ways, that not all of the commercial producers are coming in already with a date set on Broadway and kind of controlling everything, there are some who, who seem to be more sincerely trying to build partnerships and will have a little more give and take with the nonprofit partners. And I, I think that's really interesting. In my research, I'm really trying to understand how the different ways these deals get put together affects uh, how the, the process, the artistic process, creative process, and the product. And one thing that uh, one of the commercial producers, Michael David, said a few times was that the most adulterating 
uh, aspect was when you went into these partnerships already having set a date on Broadway. Mm -hmm. To his mind, at, that's the thing that adulterates the relationship, right? Because you kind of, you're, you're definitely trying to hit that goal. As opposed to the Big River model, which, uh, listening to the story uh, at the meeting, it seems there was this sincere idea, gosh, maybe we've got something here, but we need to go work it out somewhere first. Mm -hmm. And they worked with the nonprofit that was sincerely interested in the product as well, the play. And then, gosh, that went pretty well. We should probably keep working on it, though. Let's go to another one. And it was after that second production that they determined to go to Broadway. Likewise, I think we're all familiar with the success of August Osage County, which we talked about today. That was a great example of a nonprofit sincerely building a work that it passionately believed in, and after its success regionally, a determination being made that it could transfer. I don't even know if it transferred with commercial support or if it transferred yeah. on its own. It did. Yeah. It did. Right. Yeah. But in that case, it's really, it's a pure, it seems pure, yeah. right? Yep. And I, so I think this is also the thing that's, that, that I think we have to, one, another reason that the meeting is worthwhile and I think continuing to look at this issue is worthwhile is because it does seem to matter how they get put together and at what point the partnership happens and at what point enhancement money comes in or not. At what point you decide you're going to book a space, mm -hmm. you know, the, all I, those things. I would say it, the example of Next to Normal is a really uh, yeah. in, instructive one and an important one for me and my understanding of this because that show had been uh, produced at second stage with commercial um, support and it was hoped that it would go to Broadway and it wasn't ready to go to Broadway and it would have just sort of probably been put away mm -hmm. and maybe been done in the regional theaters eventually. But the, and we were interested in the show at Arena. We, we, we liked the show and, we, and knew it was needed work and we called about the show and, and that call went to David Stone who had the rights and David Stone was also interested in developing the show and so a deal was struck around our production to continue to develop that show for, toward his goals but we came into it wanting to work on the show. And we made the production, he enhanced the production to the extent that it was outside of our capacity as a nonprofit to pay the salaries that needed to be paid to the company that had made it, to reorchestrate. But there were all kinds of things that were bigger than what we could do. It's small musical, but, we, but he paid for those things. We paid for the things that we would normally have paid for. And then the show left us. And we did it as part of our relationship to our audience, and it went on to another success. Yeah, and, and we actually earned some money, Arena earned some money. But that seems like a, that, I think we made it through the intersection, everybody intact in that yeah. one. You know? But, you know, one so. thing I want to, well, Rob, you, you, you were, uh, you know, sort of uh, putting forward this idea of a shared, uh, maybe a, uh, more equitable share of the royalties of, from these deals. I mean, one thing that, that did, that did come up in this meeting is that to some degree it seems that enhancement money has been going up, you know, the amounts of enhancement paid, it seems to be going up. And, and really it's gone from like 100,000, 50,000, you know, back in the 80s to some of these deals now, you know, multi-million dollar, million, two million dollar deals, maybe some even a Wasn't more. it like a 12 million dollar deal that fell apart? No, I mean the amount of enhancement oh. paid, to the, paid to the nonprofit. And at, at one point in the meeting, it's, it's brought up, somebody says, well, what, I think David, you asked, what's causing that number to go up? Is that just increased production costs? And they, they say, yeah, that's part of it. Um, some of it might just be nonprofits that are getting, you know, sort of um, more aggressive in making their deals, but also perhaps increased reliance on this money as to cover operating, mm -hmm. right? So it's not just covering the additional costs that the nonprofit needs to cover in order to do a musical, yes, let's say, as opposed right. to a play, but really a dependence on having to hit a certain line item in the budget every year. Yeah. And I think that's an area that's, that, that is worth paying attention to, right? At the point when, we're, when there's a line item in the budget that says X amount from enhancement or commercial deals, meaning that you're really going to have to have those relationships year after year, that to me, you know, I wonder whether that could create an unhealthy dependence. And even and so, when I even hear about your sort of proposal to share these royalties, I wonder, would there be a risk, do you think, that some theaters might actually get kind of dependent on that revenue and oh, then begin to alter it's, their it's choices? Not, it's not a theoretical yeah. risk, it's yeah. actually happening. Yeah. And theaters are finding ways to mask enhancement because they're embarrassed about getting it. So they say, they can actually say, I'm not getting any. 
investment money. None of that money is flowing through my books, but oh, by the way, we know that the producer is paying this whole echelon of costs out of, out of his own office. Um, and then they, and then they have, you know, these, this, this is, enhancement is a very, very dangerous thing. Um, and then you have the measure of success being this Broadway conduit, and you have more members who, who make their money in transactional culture, and they're going to want it, and they, it just feeds on it. And then, and then you get board members investing in the production that the theater is doing that then go on Broadway, and then you get artistic directors who independently of their institutions are working on commercial projects and are raising money from their board members for those commercial projects. It is my <laughs> Um there, there was a period, historic, if we go to historical presidents, two glorious periods of for nonprofit theater. And they, they had to do with a time when there was money for nonprofit theater. The most obvious one was recently the nonprofit movement in the 60s and the uh, emergence of the, of the National Endowment for the Arts as a major force in funding them. And the reason it emerged was a simple thing, it was Sputnik. And the Russians got into space before we did, and the government panicked, and for some reason began to support the arts, <laughs> and the humanities, and education, and all those things that don't get normally supported. Science. And for a period there, and Nixon. science, right, and Nixon, and for a period there, this endowment was going up and up and up and up. They were giving us money for company work, they were endowing company work for us. The other precedent before that was the federal theater. And that too was government sponsored. It lasted only four years. It was led by the most one of the most extraordinary figures in all American theater history, and that was Hallie Flanagan Davis. And she created almost 400 theaters in this country of all types. They had black theaters, they had Jewish theaters, they had Latino theaters. They had the Mercury Theater under Austin Wells and John Hausman, which is a company doing classical work. Uh, it lasted four years. They thought it was communist, just like, you know, with Serrano and, uh, uh, and uh, Maplethorpe, they, uh, the Congress put their thumbs down on it uh, and brought uh, Halley up uh, to testify on the communist nature of her, uh, of her undertakings, and they asked her if Christopher Marlowe was a communist. And she said, let it be known that Christopher Marlowe was the greatest playwright after Shakespeare of the Elizabethan period. There also was the group theater. The group theater was a company of great actors who also trained. They trained under Lee Strasberg, who was one of the directors of the theater. And they had Stella Adler, they had Luther Adler, they had uh, Jay Wood Bromberg, they had Malaya Kazan, they had Clifford Odets, they had uh, Francho Tone, they had an extraordinary company, Francis Farmer. It was a commercial company. They didn't have non-commercial, non-profit companies then. And Kluhrman, in his book, uh, Fervent Years, laments and regrets the fact that they were a non-commercial operation forced to function under a commercial umbrella. As a result, it only lasted nine years. And all of their people ultimately went you know, to Hollywood, like Francho Tone and Aunt Elia Kazan, uh, who then came back to Broadway, became a director. Stella Adler remained as an actress, a theater actress. Luther Adler remained a theater actor as well as a movie actor. They came back to do what they were trained to do. Uh, but there was that commercial component that ruined them. They couldn't balance their budget. So money remains the issue, and money has to be provided by the government. Uh, I don't know if it'll ever happen, but it's the only way our theaters are going to survive. And on, on that note, um, uh, we're going to move outside, because I, I want to make sure that we're respectful of the artists who need this space. Uh, mm -hmm. So just a couple days, we'll move outside. We can continue the conversation out there. We are selling books. Just so you know that this is a report that we felt everyone should have access to. Uh, so we, you can download it for free on iTunes. You can download it for 99 Kindle. cents on Kindle. <laughs> I am not a very good marketer in that regard. Uh, that said, it helps us if you buy the book. It was an enormously expensive study to put together. Uh, and, uh, and just in terms of all the work that went into it. And all of, we have some like little haul around mugs and set up theater common mugs in the book. All those things, just that money just goes directly into artists' pockets to do research on the field. So just to say that it helps us, but if you can't afford it, you should have it for free and you can download it. Not the mugs, though. The mugs you have to pay. You, can't, you can download the mug. You, you can just download have to put it on your wall. Yeah, put it on your wall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Um, so we're going to head out. Yeah. Uh, and, and the show that's rehearsing in here is uh, Whistler in the Dark's production of Tales from Ovid, directed by Mick Tanker.